Hey, it is Andy from Fence Post, and in a recent video, I shared the top 10 albums that I listen to most from my vinyl collection. This is something I track on Discogs, the total number of spins of every single record in my collection. Granted, that tracking only goes back to about 2019 or so. Still, it got me thinking, what bands get played the most? In this video, I'm answering that question. First, let's go through the process of compiling the list. I exported my entire collection from Discogs into a Google Sheets document and ran some SUMIFs formulas on the back end for band name and album spins. I did some filtering and I devised this list. While there is some overlap in the artists, half of this list contains artists that were not on the video I did covering the top 10 albums I listen to most on vinyl including three in the top five and my number one artist. For the artists that do overlap, I'll be talking a little bit about some of the other albums, the ones that weren't on the most played albums list. Let's get started. Voxtrot is one of the bands that wasn't on my most listened to albums list, but I'm sure that will change eventually, especially now that they've released this and this. Early Music, which contains their first two five-song EPs, and Cut From The Stone, which is a compilation of b-sides and rarities. I have been a fan of Voxtrot since the moment I got my hands on a radio station promo of their debut EP, Raised By Wolves, way back in 2006. That one, like I said, you can find right here on Easy Music. The title track and the start of something, both on that EP, have really been favorites of mine ever since. Like a handful of my favorite bands, I became a bit of a completist when it comes to box trots released works on vinyl. They only had a lone full-length album right here, self-titled, which came out in 2007, but they released quite a few singles on 7-inch, almost hitting the double digits, honestly. And it is those singles that propelled Voxtrot's super infectious, jangly indie pop into the top 10. Number nine is Woods. Bend Beyond by the indie psych folk band Woods is the one that hit my top 10 albums list, but they have many more that I really, really love. In my top 10's album list, I noted that Bend Beyond saw the band injecting more rock into their original lo-fi psychedelic folk sound. This continued to a greater extent with their 2014 album with Light and with Love. Then in 2016, they gave us City Sun Eater in the River of Light. That's a bit of a mouthful. Here they added more horns, woodwind instruments, and the result was shockingly good with hints of 1970s style jazz fused with some like funk. I mean, it's, it's such a unique sound. Love is Love right here from 2017 mellowed things out a bit, and that trend continued with Strange to Explain in 2020. Not shown here, though I do have it. Woods has a new album coming out this fall, and you can rest assured I'll be getting my hands on that as soon as it comes out. Here on my YouTube channel, I've covered a few Saint Etienne albums, and I was kind of surprised to see them hit the list, as there isn't a specific album or single or even compilation in my collection that really even comes close to hitting the top 10 in terms of total spins. But like Voxtrot, because I, ha I literally have so many items in my collection from Saint Etienne, it's solidly cemented in at number eight. In my haul video from a trip to a record store in Fort Worth back in June, another hint, I'm going again this coming weekend, I shared that I finally found a copy of Tales from the Turnpike House. Released in 2005, this has some really solid tracks like A Good Thing and Stars Above Us. It's a totally solid record and it really embodied that down-tempo style of dance pop that Saint Etienne is kind of known for since their earliest days. And speaking of early releases, it is no surprise to me that this right here, the original 1991 pressing of their debut album, Box Space Alpha, is up there. Now, I don't know exactly when I picked up this album, but I do know 
that it was likely sometime around 2000s, the early 2000s, and I snagged it for a cool $8. For an original UK pressing, that's pretty damn good. And it's worth quite a bit more these days. One artist I'm really not surprised to see on this list is Built to Spill. Of all the bands featured here and on the top 10 albums list, this one has been a favorite for the longest. I've mentioned it before, but I discovered them upon the release of their 1997 album, Perfect From Now On. Of course, if you've watched other videos on my channel, you probably have seen that 1999's Keep It Like a Secret was my first ever brand new vinyl purchase. Or that last year's When the Wind Forgets Your Name right here was in my top three albums of 2022. And that still holds true to this day. This album is so, so good. Aside from a handful of oddball releases like Daniel Johnston covers and the long out of print live record, the only one I'm missing in my collection from Built to Spill is their debut. I just, I love the quirky nature of Doug Marsh's vocals and how surprisingly evocative and emotive his lyrics can be. They don't really fit with those vocals, but it works so, so well. They have this shocking depth to them that isn't always apparent on first listening to Built to Spill. And of course, right over here, we have You in Reverse, which is another one that is up there in my spins going against your mind. So good. Gone. Oh, I love that record. Number six, almost to the top five here. For a band I didn't really pay attention to until late 2019 and early 2020, Big Thief has come to dominate my turntable. Capacity right here. Two Hands, which was on my top albums list. And of course, last year's Dragon New Warm Mountain, I Believe in You. They all frequent my turntable, a lot. Their ability to flirt with lots of different styles and do so in a way that is just so cohesively them, so cohesively Big Thief, it's one of those traits that really sets this band apart. Dragon New Warm Mountain right here was actually my number one album of 2022. And I likened this double album to other double albums like Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness by the Smashing Pumpkins and the White Album. I mean, the frickin' White Album by the Beatles and how it kind of presents this ground breaking territory for the band. It was that way in both of those and it's that way with Big Thief. It doesn't necessarily have the heavier indie rock infused tracks like Not from Two Hands or Shark Smile from Capacity or even others from Masterpiece right here. It still does get that familiar indie folk that you get from all of these albums. They're all really, really great albums. I still can't believe it took me until 2019 to figure that out. Entering the top five, Blonde Redhead. This really is a list of my all-time, long-time favorites. I talked a little bit about 23 and this one right here, Melody of Certain Damaged Lemons from the indie and art rock band Blonde Redhead in my top albums list. And I'll go a step down on that list to the next most played one from my collection, Misery is a Butterfly. This one is really, really fascinating because it comes with a terrifying backstory. Lead singer Kazu Makino spends a great deal of her time and energy in this album reflecting on the experience and aftermath of an accident where she was trampled by a horse. This left her hospitalized and they weren't even sure she was gonna be able to talk again. This left her bedridden and hospitalized for a long time and honestly, traumatized as well. It was here that the band kind of really began to move away from the earlier experimentalish art rock of their first five albums and into a dreamier sound that has, to some extent, continued to this day. You even get it right here on this EP called Three O'Clock. Like Woods from earlier on in this list, Blonde Redhead is set to release a new album later this year. It'll be the first in a whopping nine years since Barrigan. It's called Sit Down for Dinner, and I've pre-ordered it from a Levitation Records, and I'm super excited about this pressing. It's so interesting, it's on strawberry parfait splatter wax. I think there are still copies available too. 
So seek that one out. From what I've heard so far is they've given us about four songs. It's kind of like their last bargain from 2014. It blends that dreamy-ish sound with their mid-era and some of that art rock from the earlier years, from the 1990s. So good. And I'm really, really looking forward to it. It might be one of my most anticipated albums of this fall. Three of the upcoming artists weren't in my top albums lists. Are you ready? Number four is... Honestly, really no surprise to me, David Bowie. David Bowie actually tied with Blonde Redhead for spins. I think part of the reason Bowie is so high is due to the size of my Bowie collection. Between LPs and seven and singles and compilations and even a soundtrack or two, I have a whopping 30 items in my collection. At the top is the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust followed closely by Space Oddity. If you were to ask what my favorites were, I'd probably say the first two from his Berlin trilogy, which would be Low and Heroes, both from 1977. I'm also not counting The Idiot here, which was a big collaboration between Iggy Pop and David Bowie. Iggy writing most of the lyrics, and Bowie composing much of the music. It's dubbed as a studio album by Iggy Pop though, hence its exclusion. I do have this one interesting bootleg called Iggy vs. Ziggy, which is a live performance from 1977 or 1978, and both artists are kind of nude on the cover. It's a blend of songs predominantly featuring Iggy Pop that dates back to songs from his debut with the Stooges. Number three, maybe this is a surprise to you, but it's not a surprise to me. Say what you want about Morrissey, but I can't deny how much I love the music of the Smiths. If I were to include Morrissey's solo stuff, it would be a number two artist on this list, but I'm not, so it's comfortably in at number three. One of the reasons the Smiths is so high, like Vox Trot, and Saint Etienne is due to the fact that I have quite the sizable collection of singles. Here are two of them, and many of them have had quite a few spins, though none enough to propel them into my top 10 spins list. I also listened to the Smiths quite a bit earlier this year after Andy Rourke passed away. Rourke, of course, was the bassist for the Smiths, and at the time, I put together my list of my top 10 bass lines from Songs by the Smiths. I definitely recommend checking that one out. Personally, I think my favorite album will always be The Queen Is Dead. Just all around solid tracks. There is a light that never goes out. Big Mouth Strikes Again. I just love those and never had no one ever. So, so good. The Smiths in at number three, easily. Kevin Morby comes in at a solid number two. I've been obsessed with Morby's music since about 2019 when he released Oh My God. And to be honest, Kevin Morby has been featured on this list right here before. He was in Woods right up through Bend Beyond. Before falling in love with Morby's solo work, I was also quite a big fan of his band, The Babies with Cassie Ramone from Vivian Girls. These days, Morby just dominates my turntable. It's not any album in particular, really. I listen to it all quite a bit. You've got City Music and last year's album, This Is a Photograph. There's Sundowner, which topped as number one on my top albums list. I mean, I just spun Singing Saw like three or four days ago. Coming up this fall, Morby is gonna release more photographs which is kind of a continuum of last year's album, This Is A Photograph. That release is technically out now, though it won't be out on vinyl for a few more months. And yes, I've already pre-ordered that one as well. That brings me to number one, an artist that is not on my top albums list, though it came very, very close, just falling shy by one spin. Are you ready for it? Bell and Sebastian, probably my all-time favorite band. Yes, Bell and Sebastian, what Jack Black's character Barry calls sad bastard music in the film adaptation of Nick Hornby's High Fidelity from 2000. I have loved Bell and Sebastian since probably the late 90s or early 2000s, and no single album really stands out to me. Most of them are pretty good, though I definitely have a predilection towards their early stuff. In particular, if you're feeling sinister, 
Tiger Milk. Dear Catastrophe Waitress, right here from 2003. Hint, check out my top 20 albums turning 20 in 2023. Oh God, that's a mouthful. And The Life Pursuit from 2006. After a few I would consider not really the greatest. Essentially anything released between 2010 and 2020, the band returned in the past two years with two new albums, a bit of previous right here in 2022 and late developers right here back in January of 2023. And I think they have really returned to form with both of these records. This one was in my top albums of 2022. This one, well, we're not done with 2023, so we'll see. Still, my favorites have to be from that early era. These two records will always be regulars in my collection, along with, of course, Tiger Milk, The Boy with the Arab Strap, and If You're Feeling Sinister. There you have it, that rounds out the list. Do you track your spins by album in your collection? I'd love to know. Am I the only one that does this? Please let me know I am not the only one because I feel a little bit nutty. And if you do, what are the top bands that you spin from your list? Once again, if anything I've covered up here behind me is intriguing to you and you'd like me to see me go a little bit more in depth, be it an unboxing and album review or even a ranking the top albums from my collection from some artist. Let me know down in the comments as well and I'll put that video together in the future. Next up, check out the video I mentioned earlier. You can check that out right here. Until then, I am Andy and I'll see you next time.